All right, what is up guys? I know I have not posted in a couple days. I think uh, the last time I posted was the dunk session on Friday. I haven't really talked to you guys about that, but um, Zay jumped way better than we thought. Austin was not doing poorly. He, uh, he just got frustrated during the session, but he did not do bad at all. Um, and I jumped really well. So everyone is healthy now. Um, everyone is jumping fairly well. Austin's hip is kind of figured out, but we just have to slowly add speed back into his approach. And we are coming up on what is, I'm calling stretch shortening cycle February. So that will be fun. Um, I'm actually really excited about it. I know the guys are, are pretty amped for it as well as they should be. But the whole point of the last month was basically training to train. And so I know a lot of you guys that watch this are my athlete um, and you probably have, you know, some questions about why I do some of the things that I do. Um, but stretch shortening cycle is basically anytime you have a fast change from eccentric to isometric to concentric, there's something called the, um, just try to dial this down a little bit. There's something called the amortization phase and that is basically the period of time when you're switching between eccentric and concentric. So it's that brief isometric period. Now in track, you wanna see, well, generally speaking, the shorter the amortization, the better the transfer of elastic energy during the jump. So this is classical, what I was taught in terms of plyometrics. Uh, you know, you, you dissipate less energy as heat the tendon is going to be better at storing and releasing energy in those shorter periods of time. And you have a better deflection or whatever you're trying to do, collision with the ground, right? It's a more elastic uh, collision. There's less, less deformation, right? That, that's good and dandy and that makes a lot of sense. However, in the last 10 or 15 years, what we know about tendons and stretch shortening cycles has changed a little bit, right? So a lot of the time when you look at research, you'll look at things like joint stiffness, you'll look at things like tendon stiffness, you'll look at things like hysteresis. Joint stiffness is just a measure of basically how much give the tendon has. Um, hysteresis is a measure of stress and strain and I guess energy. So it's basically like uh, a curve that shows you how much energy you're losing whenever it deforms and reforms. So if you have a better hysteresis curve, that means it's better at storing and releasing energy. Um, that's kind of the point of what shoes do, is they try to give you a better return so that you don't lose energy. Um, and in some cases, it can augment performance because of the biomechanics, right? So when you jump, for example, me, I push on the ground over a really long time, my shoe almost functions like a little trampoline by giving me more time to generate force. It doesn't actually increase the, the force production, but it gives me more time to, uh, to generate force, it maximizes impulse, which I haven't really thought about the physics of a trampoline, but I guess in some senses that's probably true. You have more time to push on the ground uh, or push on the trampoline. The trampoline is storing the energy though, whereas in the body, you know, that's mostly done in, in the tendon. Um, that all said, more recent research on the stretch shortening cycle um, basically has talked about how augmenting force production from the tendons can be done by essentially stretching them more, right? And so if you have a softer tendon that you can pull on more aggressively, you will get more energy out of that tendon, right? Because it's easier to stretch because it's softer, so you can stretch it more. That's what I believe Isaiah's Achilles is probably like. And I don't think it's like the stiffer, the better. I think it's just like maybe the better you can use it. I don't think it's as simple as just saying stiffer is better because you might not be able to stretch the tendon at all. So there's probably like, you know, stiffening the tendon if you're, or I don't even think it's necessarily stiffening the tendon, it's just getting more energy out of the tendon. Whether that's by, you know, it actually getting softer and your muscles stronger and you're stretching it further, you know, to, to get more energy out of it, or it's a stiffer tendon that you stretch further, or it's, you know, whatever. There's tons of ways that you could hypothetically increase impulse um, during a jump. And so I don't think like, I do think it's relevant, like the specifics of it, because in my experience, when I do things that would increase joint stiffness, Isaiah jumps worse. Um, you know, if I do, a, oh my gosh, there we go. If I do a lot of 
really quick stretch shortening cycles with very short ground contact times. My expectation with that would be that there are, and it depends on the plyo, because if you do pogo hops, that's gonna load the Achilles more. If you do something like a squat jump, that's gonna load the patella more. If you land on your heel, that's not gonna load the Achilles basically at all. Maybe as you roll onto the ball of the foot, it will. Or if you land flat footed, you're gonna have a lot less load in the Achilles. Um, versus if you land uh, you know, on the ball of the, ball of the foot, you're going to have a lot of load in the Achilles and you don't let the heel touch the ground. It's going to be very, very high loading. And then on the knee, uh, generally speaking, if you're landing on the heel, you're going to load the knee a lot more um, in the jump. So that said, I have found in my experience over many, many years of trial and error and testing and t- looking at research and also kind of taking that into account, if you want to jump high uh, off two feet, actually in general, what I've found for dunking is you want to pick a plyo that feels like the jump. And so you could hypothetically, like, you know, classically, like I said, what you would do is you would pick longer ground contact time plyos, go to shorter ground contact time plyos, higher stiffness, you know, go from double leg to single leg, higher heights, you know, whatever. You, that, that's generally how you would want to progress them. In my experience, it's not the best idea to do that for two foot jumpers because they need to generate a lot of force. They need very high impulse. And there's a new RSI metric, I believe. Matt Watson, a friend of mine, and then Thomas Kortenbeck have really worked on. It's it's a maybe dynamic RSI, I think is what it's called, but it's basically a modified RSI metric for those longer ground contact time plyometrics where you have higher force, you have a lower RSI, and a really high jump height. And traditionally, RSI, reactive strength index, is biased towards short ground contact times. And that can really be detrimental for two foot jumpers because RSI does not really correlate with great two foot jumpers. And even in some cases, one foot dunkers, like power jumpers, it, I mean, it correlates, but it's like not perfect. Whereas like if you're a speed jumper, or high jumper or sprinter, RSI, specifically for high jump, I've seen RSI really correlate strongly for guys that are really good at it or long jump sprinters, you know, it's not perfect because your foot length matters and there's some other stuff. But generally speaking, if you improve RSI, you're gonna be better at those shorter ground contact time activities. And uh, for dunking, that's just not the case, right? Like, I mean, if you improve RSI in two foot jumping, it really doesn't make you jump higher. For one foot jumping, I would say that's kind of true, but it might fatigue you a lot and usually run into injuries, some other stuff. So there's some other issues there, but uh, because it's only three steps typically in dunking, you might get a gallop in left, right, left, you know, gallop in, you go right, right, right foot contacts on his left, right, left. You don't have a lot of momentum and you have a really long, what I would call like draw on the ground. And that draw on the ground means that your, your force production is going to look a lot different than it would if it were like high jump. When I say draw on the ground, I mean the, the, the stride where you're, uh, where your center of mass is relative to the touchdown of your foot on a one foot jump is the distance is a lot greater in dunking versus high jump or long jump or something else. Like you really kind of throw that foot out in front of you far because you don't care about rotation. You just care about max height. So you can lean back further. You can take a, that stride can become a little longer. Um, but you know, the whole jump is, is different, uh, in my experience and watching high jumpers, I've observed this many, many times. The more you lean back, the more you throw that leg out in front of you, the more you plan on the heel, you're gonna have a crazy high braking forces, which gives you a lot of time to jump high, lets you generate a lot of force, but it doesn't let you flip. And in high jump, you wanna flip. Uh, so this is kind of a difference, cause I know there's probably some track coaches out there and you hear a lot of different stuff. But with dunking specifically, I'm talking about dunking. I don't think that, uh, you know, with plyos, you wanna really just try to drive up stiffness Uh, because you can't generate enough momentum to be able to use it. So you need the right amount of stiffness. And I've found that, again, plyos can help, but you want to pick plyos that feel very similar uh, sensationally to whatever type of jumper you are. So for me, alternate leg bounding, (whistles) ma, 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 chef's kiss, really, really good. Um, Acceleration work, really, really good. That stuff has always really, really helped me. Um, single leg hops, single leg depth jump hop to hop really, really helped me, but you can only do it a couple times of the year. Like every time I've always done high plyo volume, my jumping goes to shit until like a long time afterwards. Then I start to see it pay dividends. 
and that just goes for volume in general, like volume of intense work in general, the longer you hit that stuff, the more your vertical plummets. Like the last session I had, if you guys watched that video, I mean, you can tell the previous sessions, like I was jumping higher and higher and higher. Yesterday was the, or Friday was the first time I felt like, okay, my vertical is like back, you know, it's like really kind of right there on the cusp of being a uh, freaky, freaky levels. Whereas it's been pretty depressed. And by depressed, I mean, just like down since dunk camp, because I got back, you know, my knee was kind of banged up. So I rehabbed it back and I really wasn't jumping high. I was on lower rim. I was jumping okay, but I was like on lower rims. I really, uh, didn't get to jump too much on a 10 foot rim. So like, yeah, I guess I was jumping okay. But then as soon as I started to really hammer the, the weight room with Isaiah and Austin, uh, specifically Isaiah, cause Austin was in Spain, my vertical just plummeted. You know, my power clean went through the roof. My squat went through the roof, you know, all this stuff improved, but my jumping went to shit. And the reason why is because my rate of force development drops off a lot when that happens for two reasons. One is fatigue. Two is the, the, the amount of specific work of intense specific work is relatively lower. So you're not really seeing progressive overload there. And then three, when you increase force production and Rolf talked about this, you might be able to generate more impulse, but it happens over a longer period of time with jumping. We don't necessarily care about time because we have all the time in the world. We can, if we know how to get in position and use it, we can maximize it. However, uh, I was running a little bit too fast to be able to like really take advantage of it. And I haven't been jumping at a high level for a while. So me personally, I jump better when I run slower. And that was a big takeaway from the other day. You guys will hear me talk about that in the session. I'm just able to generate a shit ton more force when I do that. It's a lot more forceful. And that's how it's always been for me. Um, I can take off quickly and I can take off slowly, but when I just want peak, peak height, when I run a little slower, I definitely jump higher. Um, typically how it works for me is I go from moving faster to moving slower and I jump higher uh, as I start to progress to those slower run-ups. There's a cop behind me and there's cops everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, how the session went. That's the stretch shortening cycle, I guess, rant or plyometric rant. I'm gonna pick plyos that really pair nicely with each of their types of jumps. So we'll do this next week. This week is the end of the week, or the end of the month, sorry. So eccentric January is over. We are done doing truly, truly accentuated eccentrics. I'm talking over 100% of their concentric lift upwards. When it's called accentuated, it just means you're focusing on that part of it relative to the concentric. Technically, you're not beyond your eccentric force generating capacity because obviously they would I guess at a given velocity they are because they have to lower faster, but obviously you, you would break if that were the case. But they did a great job. I'm super proud of them. They killed it. This week's going to be super easy, super chill for them. Um, I'm going to do something similar to last week. I figured out, I don't think it's his hamstring tendon as much as like my glute tendon. So that's been getting a lot better as I've worked in uh, abduction. And if you guys have hamstring tendon off the, uh, definitely would look into that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the session here, guys. It's a longer video, but there's a lot of good content in here, so I hope you guys like it. And uh, I'll talk to you guys either at the gym or on the, the way back home. So see you guys. Good? All right, so I have told you guys about what I thought was, I'll pick this up, what I thought was hamstring tenopathy. It's actually not. It's definitely glute ham, or glute tenopathy. So like any other tendinopathy, what you want to do is slow, very slow reps uh, or isos. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to go like four by six for this. I did hamstring work and didn't feel anything. And then uh, that's how, kind of how I knew. And then recently I've been talking to my brother about it. And he said the same thing. He's like, when I had it, it was actually glute. And do external rotation and abduction, it should work. And it has been. So I'm going to keep doing that. And hopefully it will clear up by about a week. They're good. You can shut it off now. All right, so I didn't get a ton of gym content for you guys. Uh, the reason being, none of us really were inspired or motivated to film gym content. Not because of any other reason than we're just very tired from training right now and there's nothing really exciting happening. So it's hard to motivate yourself to wanna film like slow squats or like rehab type stuff. I mean, obviously you guys, that's probably the thing you guys are most interested in, but that's the thing that's like the least exciting for us to film and post. Um, so there's not gonna be 
a ton, a ton, a ton of content in regards to that stuff. So Isaiah and I and Austin uh, came in today. We did a very easy lift. Zay, I told basically, and Austin, I was like, it's whatever you want, you know? And I think that might be weird for some of you guys, but they've been training with me for six years, seven years. So they know kind of what my expectations are and they know what is and isn't okay. So I basically told them, I want you guys to, uh, want you guys to do uh, an easy lift. Also it's hilarious, those guys are, they, they recognize me um, back there. They were like, oh, I've seen your videos before. I was like, oh, that could be a bad thing. Um, anyways, yeah, so they, Isaiah did slow squats. Um, no, he didn't even really do slow squats. He was gonna work up to a single and basically decided like, F that, I don't wanna do that. I think he's pretty, he napped. And for whatever reason, when that kid naps, he just gets, he dies, he just gets super tired. So that's what happened. Um, is this working? Yeah, it is. Maybe I'll hold it. I'll hold it. We'll see if that audio is better. <clears throat> yeah, so he uh, he did that. Uh, worked up to a heavy heavy single. I think he did 365, which I'm fine with. I didn't want, I mean, his max is 480 and a half squat. I just wanted him to get some sort of load, and then he did a set of six slow at 225 for his TFL. The goal is to have him feeling really good at the end of the week. I've been hammering those guys, and I think it just caught up with them. Uh, you know, it's finally kind of showing through shining the, the fatigue is shining through isaiah jumped well despite how much fatigue he has who knows why it might have just been adrenaline but uh or he's just at a new level and his fatigue self is really well adapted austin is uh still in my opinion he's not fatigued he's detrained so we're just getting him trained up his mobility is getting way better his his movements are looking better his squats looking cleaner he's getting down for, for first time in a long time on his squats. Um, you know, so he's adapting uh, to that stuff and ultimately staying healthy is a big, big thing for him. Um, training consistently is a big thing for him. If he gets hurt and misses a week or two or three weeks because he's hurt, that really can hurt his uh, long-term development. So that happens for everyone, but him especially. Um, I really like to keep him consistently jumping, even if it isn't well. Uh, it's important for him to maintain that because once he gets it back, he does not, uh, once he gets his vertical like back and high, he jumps super, super well. Um, and it's, uh, that, that comes down to him not taking time off. Like when he takes time off, that's when he loses his vertical. He gets hurt, takes time off, vertical goes down, and then it takes him a while to get it back. So we need to get him healthy and jumping high. And now that I'm here, it's a lot easier because usually when he's alone, he'll go rogue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's gonna be the big picture for him. So he did slow squats. We did, uh, I did slow squats as well. Didn't show those, I only worked up to 135. It was pretty boring. I didn't wanna show you guys that. There's really nothing exciting on that end. I did do calf raises seated and my hamstring tendon, I, I talked about a little bit, but it's not my hamstring tendon. Uh, I think it's my glute. So that's why sitting on it and stuff like that hurts that's why i feel it on hip thrust but i really feel it in almost like abduction and extension and anytime you're with a tendon and you want to get it better you want to be on the coattails of pain meaning you want to just induce a little bit of discomfort but not be like crazy uncomfortable and uh that's what i did today i think i worked up to like 60 on the abduction cable abduction um and yeah that was pretty much it uh like i said some guys were talking to me and kind of recognized uh, my videos and then uh, I got to talking about some of the beef with me and Ben Patrick which is always a fun topic of discussion for people I haven't talked about it openly but you know on my YouTube channel it doesn't really matter it is kind of funny now especially because he's like so big but there is quite a bit of beef there uh, I would love to get an open form debate with him on athleticism on athleticism because I think it would be fun, but I don't think he would ever be open to that. Uh, so yeah, kind of talked a little bit about our history that a lot of people don't know, and it was entertaining. I'm sure you guys would love to hear that. That's story time, but it is, uh, I don't know. It's a sensitive subject. I don't like to, not for me, but I'm sure any, you know, obviously he'd have to be open to that conversation. I don't think he would want to be. Uh, but I'd be more than happy to have an open discussion with him about 
our history, what happened, I'm sure uh, may probably be for the best, maybe be really interesting, <laughs> but we haven't set that up. So anyways, yeah, that's the video guys. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. It's a short one today. Um, that first part, rewatch, go back, watch this uh, to the gym video, like on the way there, the first 15 minutes, there's so much good content in there. And I feel like a lot of you guys would benefit from honestly studying that information. And if there's something you didn't understand, rewatching it or looking it up, because if you understand those concepts, you're going to be way further ahead as an athlete and a coach. And I think that a lot of people don't understand what I just explained. So if you do, you're ahead of the curve. Uh, anyways, guys, catch you later. Bye.